Okay, here's scene number one. It's about three in the morning, and you're in a wheat field with him. He pulls his junker off the country road, got out a blanket, and just started walking. You followed. The hip-high blades of grass were wet with dew. You could still feel the cool of that water when you think about it now. And you could smell the wheat. You could smell that it's green, that there's acres of dark and they're just screaming with life. He finds a spot and pushes the wheat down. Then the blanket goes. Then you go. You remember that all you could see were a few stars in the sky, silhouettes of tweet, trees waving on the horizon, wheat cover, hovering over you like skyscrapers, and him kissing your arm, your shoulder, your cheek, your eyelid. And the two of you, as you were about to leave, he tells you that it's after four, <laughs> and you don't believe him. Okay, here's another scene. You're sitting at your desk, and out of the corner of your eye, you catch a jar of potpourri. There are about 20 white roses in the glass. They're all still whole. You dried them yourself. So when you see the roses, you stop your work, and you let your eyes wander until they can't see anymore. And then you daydream. You remember him coming over with two dozen long stem white roses taking you out on a picnic. You ended up on the balcony of a music theater eating croissants and strawberries with sugar, drinking champagne, listening to a pianist play Mozart on the stage below. And you remember that when he took you to dinner afterward, well, you remember that, but what you really is stuck in your mind is after dinner, you brought him back to your place and you turned on the stereo and slow danced in the dark. You moved away the next day but you put all the roses and all the leaves and all the baby's breath in a small garbage can, filled it with some water and took it with you. And that's why you keep the roses dried on your desk. Okay, I've got another one. You're fulfilling your end of the bets, so you take him to an empty road one night, fully prepared to serenade him. But everything starts to go wrong. The wind picks up and you're shivering with a chill. You're coming down with a cold and you sound nasal. You get nervous and he's going to hate it. I mean, what are you, you going to do? You're going to make a fool out of yourself for this. And you can't even think of a good song to actually sing. So you're wrecking your brains for a good tune. You should have thought of this before. He's just sitting there staring at you. And finally, you remember the song from your childhood. You, your older sister taped it for you. I mean, you don't even know who sings it. But whenever you hear it, you thought it was a song was so romantic about love lasting forever. And so you just started singing. In the back of your mind, you always thought that song was a song that you'd share with your husband but you didn't tell him that part. Now jump ahead a couple of weeks. You're at a bar with him. It's crowded, you're pretty drunk. After the bar closes, he takes you to his car, his already pathetic car. You know, the one that stalls at intersections, and by now the driver's side door is stuck and it won't open, so he has to crawl in from your side, the passenger's side. Well, he drives you to his house and he lets you in, and then he goes upstairs and he gives you a bouquet of flowers, and then he gives you this compact disc with a song that you sang to him on it. He found it, he found the name of the original singer, and by the fourth record store, he found the song. And he got it for you, girl, <laughs> for you. All right, one more. And no picnics, no serenading, no gifts. Here's a scene. You make dinner with him at your apartment. You set the table, lower the lights, and turn on some big band music real soft. He opens the wine. As you eat, the two of you start talking about politics, about the upcoming election, about abortion, the death penalty, the judicial system, about the ethical dilemma of returning clothing to a retail store simply because you've worn it and don't like it anymore, about business, about the welfare system, about philosophy. So when you can't eat anymore, you just kind of lean back in your chair and you watch him. You smile. He's your intellectual equal. He talks to you. You know, earlier that day, you were looking through the want ads because you wanted a new apartment, and you mentioned, without thinking, that the two of you could save a lot of money by just living together. <laughs> you still can't believe that you said it, or even thought it, but the thought is still there, haunting you, teasing you in the back of your mind.